one of your hosts, Blaine, and uh, on this episode of Silver Screen Queens, we are back with another mini, and I'm going to uh, tickle your ears. That sounds very inappropriate. Um, I'm going to read to you a short story that I really like, um, slash really have a lot of beef with. Um, I'm so pumped. It is from the book Hauntings, Tales of the Supernatural, edited by Henry Mazio. Um, a friend of mine got this for me in Montana, I believe, at like a, an antique bookstore, and it's so much fun, uh, full of older stories. Like, it was published in 1968. Um, it's really cool. Anyway, the short story I'm going to read for you today is Thus I Refute Beelzy by John Colgay. Um, yeah, it's, it's really cute and fun and cool. So, without further ado, my dear friends, I'm going to get going. Let's dive in. There goes the tea bell, said Mrs. Carter. I hope Simon hears it. They looked out from the window of the drawing room. The long garden, agreeably neglected, ended in a waste plot. Here, a little summer house was passing close by beauty on its way to complete decay. This was Simon's retreat. It was almost completely screened by the tangled branches of the apple tree and the pear tree, planted too close together, as they always are in the suburban gardens. They caught a glimpse of him now and then, as he strutted up and down, mouthing and gesticulating, performing all the solemn mumbo-jumbo of small boys who spend long afternoons at the forgotten ends of long gardens. "'There he is, bless him,' said Betty. "'Playing his game,' said Mrs. Carter. "'He won't play with the other children anymore. "'And if I go down there, the temper, he comes in tired out.' "'He doesn't have his sleep in the afternoons?' asked Betty." "'You know what Big Simon's ideas are,' said Mrs. Carter. "'Let him choose for himself,' he says. "'That's what he chooses, and he comes in as white as a sheet.' "'Look, he's heard the bell,' said Betty. "'The expression was justified, though the bell had ceased ringing a full minute ago. "'Small Simon stopped in his parade exactly as if the tinny dingle had at that moment reached his ear. "'They watched him perform certain ritual sweeps and scratchings with his little stick.' and come lagging over the hot and flaggy grass toward the house. Mrs. Carter led the way down to the playroom or garden room, which was always the tea room for hot days. It had been the huge scullery of this tall Georgian house. Now the walls were cream-washed. There was coarse blue net in the windows, canvas-colored armchairs on the stone floor, and a reproduction of Van Gogh's sunflowers over the mantelpiece. Small Simon came drifting in, and according to Betty, a perfunctory greeting. His face was an almost perfect triangle, pointed at the chin, and he was paler than he should have been. The little elf child, cried Betty. Simon looked at her. No, said he. At that moment, the door opened, and Mr. Carter came in, rubbing his hands. He was a dentist, and washed them before and after everything he did. You, said his wife, home already. "'Not unwelcome, I hope,' said Mr. Carter, nodding to Betty. Two people cancelled their appointments. I decided to come home. I said, "'I hope I'm not unwelcome.' "'Silly,' said his wife. "'Of course not.' "'Small Simon seems doubtful,' continued Mr. Carter. "'Small Simon, are you sorry to see me at tea with you?' "'No, Daddy.' "'No what?' "'No, Big Simon.' "'That's right. Big Simon and Small Simon. That sounds more like friends, doesn't it?' At one time, little boys had to call their father Sir. If they forgot, a good spanking. On the bottom, small Simon, on the bottom, said Mr. Carter, washing his hands once more with his invisible soap and water. The little boy turned crimson with shame or rage. But now, you see, said Betty to help, you can call your father whatever you like. And what, asked Mr. Carter, has small Simon been doing this afternoon while big Simon has been at work? Nothing muttered his son. And you've been bored, said Mr. Carter. Learn from experience, small Simon. Tomorrow, do something amusing, and you will not be bored. I want him to learn from experience, Betty. That is my way, the new way. I have learned, said the boy, speaking like an old, tired man, as little boys so often do. 
It would hardly seem so, said Mr. Carter, if you sit on your behind all afternoon doing nothing. Had my father caught me doing nothing, I sh should not have sat very comfortably. He played, said Mrs. Carter. A bit, said the boy, shifting on his chair. Too much, said Mrs. Carter. He comes in all nervy and dazed. He ought to have his rest. He is six, said her husband. He is a reasonable being. He must choose for himself. But what game is this, small Simon, that is worthy getting nervy and dazed over? There are very few games as good as all that. It's nothing, said the boy. Oh, come, said the father. We are friends, are we not? You can tell me. I was a small Simon once, just like you, and played the same games you play. Of course, there were no airplanes in those days. With whom do you play this fine game? Come on, we must all answer civil questions, or the world would never go round. With whom do you play? Mr. Bealsey, said the boy, unable to resist. Mr. Bealsey, said his father, raising his eyebrows inquiringly at his wife. It's a game he makes up, said she. Not makes up, cried the boy. Fool. That is telling stories, said his mother, and rude as well. We had better talk of something different. No wonder he is rude, said Mr. Carter. If you say he tells lies, and then insist on changing the subject, he tells you his fantasy. You implant a guilt feeling. What can you expect? A defense mechanism. Then you get a real lie. Like in these three, said Betty, only different, of course. She was an unblushing little liar. I would have made her blush, said Mr. Carter, in the proper part of her anatomy. But Small Simon is in the fantasy stage. Are you not, Small Simon? You just make things up. No, I don't, said the boy. You do, said his father. And because you do, it is not too late to reason with you. There is no harm in a fantasy, old chap. There is no harm in a bit of make-believe. Only you have to know the difference between daydreams and real things, or your brain will never grow. It will never be the brain of a big Simon. So come on, let us hear about Miss, this Mr. Bealsy of yours. Come on, what is he like? He isn't like anything, said the boy. Like nothing on earth, said his father. That's a terrible fellow. I'm not frightened of him, said the child, smiling. Not a bit. I should hope not, said his father. If you were, you would be frightening yourself. I am always telling people, older people than you are, that they are just frightening themselves. Is he a funny man? Is he a giant? Sometimes he is, said the little boy. Sometimes one thing, sometimes another, said his father. Sounds pretty vague. Why can't you tell us what he's like? I love him, said the small boy. He loves me. That's a big word, said Mr. Carter. That might be better kept for real things like Big Simon and Small Simon. He is real, said the boy passionately. He's not a fool. He's real. Listen, said his father, when you go down the garden, there's nobody there, is there? No, said the boy. Then you think of him inside your head, and he comes. No, said Small Simon. I have to do something with my stick. That doesn't matter. Yes, it does. Small Simon, you are being obstinate said Mr. Carter. I am trying to explain something to you. I have been longer in the world than you have, so naturally I am older and wiser. I am explaining that Mr. Bealsey is a fantasy of yours. Do you hear? Do you understand? Yes, Daddy. He is a game. He is a let's pretend. The little boy looked down at his plate, smiling resignedly. I hope you are listening to me, said his father. All you have to do is say, I have been playing a game of let's pretend with someone I make up called Mr. Bealsey. Then no one will say you tell lies, and you will know the difference between dreams and reality. Mr. Bealsey is a daydream. The little boy stared at his plate. He is sometimes there, and sometimes not there, pursued Mr. Carter. Sometimes he's like one thing, sometimes another. You can't really see him, not as you see me. I am real. You can't touch him. You can touch me. I can touch you. Mr. Carter stretched out his big, white dentist's hand and took his little son by the shoulder. He stopped speaking for a moment and tightened his hand. The little boy sunk his head still lower. Now you know the difference, said Mr. Carter, between a pretend and a real thing. You and I are one thing, he is another. Which is the pretend? Come on, answer me. Which is the pretend? Big Simon and Small Simon, said the little boy. Don't, cried Betty and at once put her hand over her mouth. For why should a visitor cry don't when a father is explaining things in a scientific and modern way? Well, my boy, said Mr. Carter, I have said you must be allowed to learn from experience. 
go upstairs and right up to your room. You shall learn whether it is better to reason or to be perverse and obstinate. Go up, I shall follow you. You're not going to beat the child, cried Mrs. Carter. No, said the little boy. Mr. Beelzey won't let him. Go on, up with you, shouted his father. Small Simon stopped at the door. He said he wouldn't let anyone hurt me, he whimpered. He said he'd come like a lion, with wings on, and eat them up. You'll learn how real he is, shouted his father after him. If you can't learn it at one end, you shall learn it at the other. I'll have your breeches down. I shall finish up my cup of tea first, however, he said to the two women. Neither of them spoke. Mr. Carter finished his tea and unhurriedly left the room, washing his hands with this invisible soap and water. Mrs. Carter said nothing. Betty could think of nothing to say. She wanted to be talking. She was afraid of what they might hear. Suddenly it came. It seemed to tear the air apart. Good God, she cried. What was that? He's hurt him. She sprang out of her chair, her silly eyes flashing behind her glasses. I'm going up there, she cried, trembling. Yes, let's go up, said Mrs. Carter. Let us go up. That was not Sabal Simon. It was on the second floor landing that they found the shoe, with the man's foot still in it, like that morsel of a mouse which sometimes falls unnoticed from the side of the jaws of the cat. How fun was that? Oh my gosh, I loved it so much. Um, so there is an editor's note at the beginning of the story um, that is useful for after this, of course. Um, as many of all three of the listeners we have might have guessed, um, the identity of Beelzey is just hinted at in this story. Uh, but you might guess that he is Beelzebub the prince of the devils, um, as noted in Matthew twelve twenty four in the Bible. Um, John Milton, in his poem Paradise Lost, makes him second only to Satan himself in rank and power. The boy in the story, Small Simon, is named after his father, but perhaps the author was also thinking of the biblical sorcerer, Simon Magus. It is evident that Small Simon is engaged in some sort of sorcery, and that, like Faust, he has made a pact with the devil. Um, Faust is uh, a legend by Johann, von, oh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Um, it's just about a man who's just dissatisfied with his life and makes a pact with the devil, much like we assume um, Small Simon does in this story. So that's really cool. Um, I, I love this little story um, because I hate Mr. Carter. <laughs> Or Big Simon. Fuck Big... Oh my god. Fuck Big Simon. Like, the false progressiveness that Mr. Carter fucking foists on his family is just... Ugh. The toxic masculinity. Also, can we talk about (laughs) this one part? (laughs) This one part where... Oh, the one part where uh, Mr. Carter is like, well, I mean, like, if you guilt small Simon when he tries to tell you something, of course he's going to lie. Um, And then Betty, like, refers to someone, a character um, in these three. And she's like, she was an unblushing little liar. And then Mr. Carter is like, I would have made her blush in the proper part of her anatomy. What the fuck does that mean, Mr. Carter? Are you saying you would, like, fuck her? Is that what you're trying to say? Or is he, like, spanking her? I don't know. Either way, Mr. Carter, go fuck yourself. Um, yeah. Small Simon rules, and he did the right thing by hooking up with BLC. But yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's our short story for the week. Um, we should be back soon. I can't say exactly when with our uh, new full episode. It's going to be a real one. Um, I know some people have responded to a question um, that I asked on social media asking um, if your ex was a horror movie villain, which horror movie villain would they be? And a lot of people came up with some really cool answers. So those will be shared on the uh, next full episode of Silver Screen Queens. And I'm super excited. I think it's going to be pretty scandalous. And uh, hopefully it amuses you. 
So we will see. I hope you have had a great week so far. I hope this weekend um, is fun for you or at least, you know, relaxing. Hope you're doing what you want to do. Please remember to get out in the silence of the world and enjoy the nature that is left um, and all the all the beautiful things it's doing. Um, I wrote to a friend yesterday that it's really nice to talk to birds and to thank some spiders. Um, you know, they're, they're just beautiful and they do a lot of hard work. Uh, anyway, anyway, have fun this weekend. Uh, be kind to yourself. You're doing a great job. Uh, and hey, we'll see you uh, next time. All right. Free Palestine and happy pride, friends. Oh my god, how did I forget to say happy pride? Happy fucking pride, everybody. My fellow queers, um, you're allowed to do whatever you want uh, this month. Anything goes. I said so.